All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to welcome back Scott Greenberg, who is up in a hopefully I presume an equally sunny uh, Sherman Oaks up in Los Angeles. Yeah, Scott. Yeah, it's a nice day up the street here. Yeah, and just and why we're laughing is because I know people in the rest of the world don't believe it, but Southern California of late has just been rainy and overcast and cold. And I know we get zero sympathy from anyone else when we zero complain sympathy. about the weather. <laughs> but it's nice to get back to the sunshine. So Scott is a is a keynote speaker, author, business consultant, specializing in leadership, team dynamics, and operational efficiency. He's a former multi-unit award-winning franchise owner, owner for best customer service and management. And he has a very unique perspective on leading teams, and which makes him a valuable invaluable asset to organizations aiming for competitive uh, excellence. And you're the author of The Wealthy Franchisee. Uh, and stop the shift show, turning entrepreneur and frequent uh, uh, stop the shift show, turning your struggling hourly employees into top performing, into a top performing team, and that has been published uh, just in February of this year. Is that correct? Yeah, it just came out. Yeah, let me just show for the uh, for the folks watching. Here it is on Amazon. Stop the shift show, just in case you thought I mispronounced. Turn your struggling hourly workers into a top performing team. Excellent. So, um, you know, Scott, uh, you know, starting off, uh, just give me the genesis of this latest book, uh, where this came from. And, and, and it's a really interesting topic, as you're just saying, struggling hourly, hourly employees into a top performing team. Often people wouldn't associate hourly employees with top performing, right? I mean, I'm, and I'm saying that's our fault perception wise. Yeah, quite the opposite. When you think of hourly employees, most people are thinking of, you know, fast food employees who don't care, who get their orders wrong, who aren't especially polite or enthusiastic. And I talk to so many business owners and it's such a huge pain point. They, they refer to it as dealing with employees, especially those who are hourly employees. And so I spent more than 10 years managing them and I work with all these did all these different work environments that have hourly employees. I, I hear their pain, I see their struggles, but I also see the opportunities to help them. And so um, after hearing about this pain point for so long, after feeling it myself and then overcoming it, um, I realized that there is a gap in the market. There aren't too many people who are talking about leading this particular group. So mm -hmm. I did a bunch of research, reflected on my own experiences, found other environments that thrive with hourly workers, and, uh, and wrote this book and it's been, the re reception has been excellent and I'm really excited to be speaking on it and sharing this information and hopefully helping a lot of people. Yeah, so so tell me, I mean, one of the elements of your book is is determining your managerial, managerial style and, and avoiding common mistakes. So what, what, is a, what, is, what are some of the common mistakes and what is a good style for, for getting the best out of your hourly employees? Well, I think, you know, the, the way, business owners and managers and, and people come to me is they say what the problem is with their employees. And the question is, how do I get my employees to, and then, then fill in the blank, care about their work, be more engaged, show up on time, apply for jobs. That the idea is there's something broken about the employee. So what needs to be done to fix them and to change them? And not that there aren't issues with employees where they need more support and more education, perhaps more discipline. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that, look, if it's one or two employees, okay, there's some mishires there. But if it's a chronic problem, that also says something about management. Yep. And some people are watching, listening, this may feel a little bit defensive right now. But I, I think that until we're bringing absolutely excellent management to our employees, we'll never really know how good the employees can be. And in most cases, I think there's room for improvement. And so part of that is stylistic, reflecting on your own management style. Do you tend to be very dictatorial? Are you very much a people person? You know, what are what are the uh, the biases that you have? And a lot of times, you know, um, the vast majority of people out there, I think, you know, something like 90 percent of people have like, you know, 10 years on the job before they ever get any formal management training. So most people manage the way they were managed. So there's yeah. this legacy, right, from generation to generation of mediocre or poor management. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we need to be aware of what is our own style? You know, what are our own biases? What are our own feelings that we project onto employees? And how might we be getting in our own way? So are we an asset to our organization 
or are we a liability? We, uh, you know, liability. Yeah, and it's interesting what you say about uh, yeah leadership or management training. I mean, I could even look back at my career, and you know, I've I've been you know leading teams and managing and VPs and even leading companies, and and to be honest, I never had any training. Um, so a lot of it was learning, learning on the go, and kind of teaching myself. But there is that you know we do we we don't invest enough in ourselves, and we often wait. And there's the other part: we often wait for companies to do it for us. Like, well, they're they didn't train me, so I'm just going to sit here and muddle through. And then I always kind of think nowadays, I think, well, how much money and time do we invest in our hobbies and getting coaches? And you know, a lot of people play golf; they get a golf coach and all. But how much time and effort do you invest in what puts bread on the table and maybe your management skills? Well, when you think about how important the people factor is, right, you think that it would be a no brainer mm -hmm. that there'd be that kind of training. And usually when people get leadership training, it's in the systems, in the operations themselves. A lot of the work that I do is, you know, with hourly workers. So it might be a restaurant or a hotel or a factory, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And usually the people who make it to management were promoted because they were competent as employees. So maybe they get, you know, they're taught how to set up a schedule, how to run payroll, some of the, the systems things, but they aren't taught how to have influence, how to build culture, how to engage employees, all those soft skills that we tend to kind of like, you know, write off. But these things become a huge headache when people don't have the skill set and how to promote someone else's mindset. And so I think that there's an opportunity there that if we get more training, if we seek more mm -hmm. training and make it a priority. We could do a lot more with our teams, but it's not going to happen until there's management ups its game. And and it's interesting thing you mentioned there is soft skills. And I think probably one of the biggest mistakes ever was the invention of that term soft skills. Yeah, right. Because it, it really does allow management to go uh, soft skills. Yeah, uh, cut that out of the budget. That's silly. Uh, right. Rather than go, this is it's critical. And the other thing I know you talk about in your book, and this is this is. Uh, getting management training and learning to be a good manager is one thing. Coaching is a whole other level. And that's something that very, very few people know how to do and certainly know innately know how to do. Most of us or most people, you know, your last experience of coaching or being working with the coach was probably some guy standing on the sideline shouting at you in, uh, in high school or whatever. Uh, and, and coaching is so incredibly important, but so very few, few people know what coaching really is, especially in a business context. Yeah, there really should be no distinction between managing and coaching, but I think there's a different perception. Mm -hmm. And I think of a manager as my boss, the person who's telling me what to do, the person who I have to please, or I might lose my job, right? Whereas a coach is someone who I feel like is on my side, that mm -hmm. we have the same interests. We're, we're obviously interested in, in winning the game, but I also feel like the coach is there to develop me, to help me grow. And the coach is also there to bring me and my teammates together as a strong team, that we're all in it together. That's how it should be in a workplace, right? Um, but there's a difference in perception there. But knowing how to do that, how to have that relationship, while still making sure that the job gets done, that the games get won, that you know that you're hitting your metrics, hitting your benchmarks. There's a lot that's there. So it's what we need are a combination of those hard skills and those soft skills, without judging either one. And both mm -hmm. are important, and both will do better when we put some emphasis on the other as well. Yeah. And you also uh, talk about creating a sense of purpose and ownership. And I think that that is obviously that's obviously become more to the fore of late, you know, where people really want to feel like, you know, they're doing something meaningful or there's a purpose to what they're doing or just to feel good about who they're working, who they're working for or what company they're they're working with. Um, but without obviously going too far. Uh, creating uh, creating that sense of purpose and ownership. How do you go about that? Especially when you you know you're maybe working with hourly workers who who may not have that same sense of connection that perhaps you know other types of employees may have. Yeah, I hear this a lot, especially from small business owners. As they say, well, you know, I want them to treat them like like they own the place, mm -hmm. and I have a simple solution for them: give them equity. Yeah. Right. Well, no one's going to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Early workers are different than those on salary. It's why I wrote mm -hmm. this book. Right. Yeah. The, the, the economics, the socioeconomics, you know, they can't rely on stable income. They can't rely on stable hours. They're more likely to be going to other jobs, to school, to other things. There are so many differences you know, between them. So the expectation that someone is earning an hourly wage, that's how they get paid. 
if they're going to treat it like they own the place, is it's just, it's unreasonable. They don't yeah. own the place, but they are part owners in the culture. And when you can take time to create a culture where they feel that they're a part of something, that what they do has meaning, that they're praised, they're appreciated, um, that then starts to make them care about the work that they're actually doing, right? They don't want to let their teammates down, their fa their professional family down. And so what we want to do is be very deliberate about creating culture, about maintaining culture. And when that's there, then people care more about the focal point of the culture, which is the work that has to get done. But there's so much more to culture than, you know, being nice to people or buying them pizza. That's it's just, I'm so, I'm so tired of hearing about pizza or Starbucks gift cards. Those <laughs> things are cool, but they don't make me care about my teammate or they don't give me yeah. a sense of purpose. They're not the things that drive me. No one has ever been about to quit a job they hate and they get a slice of pizza. They're like, oh, in that case, I'm going to stick around. Pizza has never kept someone on the job. Yeah, it's like that whole thing up in, uh, you know, up in Silicon Valley, you know, where the, you know, the foosball tables and the massage chairs and all of that. And that's supposed Maybe to be bars, great. Yeah. Culture. yeah. Uh, but on that, on that point, right, uh, a lot of people just allow culture to develop organically, right? And when it develops organically, it normally is a pretty good reflection of the leader, the owner, or whoever is is in charge. So it obviously, if you're going to create a, a, a really good culture, it has to be intentional, but you also have to be quite self-aware of what you're projecting into the business. Absolutely. I mean, if you are the manager, if you're the owner, you're the leader, you know, you're the one who is, you know, essentially defining what the culture is going to be. Mm -hmm. And then it's your job to maintain that culture. And so when culture isn't set deliberately, then it becomes what it becomes on its yeah. own. And too often it becomes something that's really dysfunctional, that's not you know, productive. And so you don't want a culture by default, you want one by design. And for me, that's one of the primary objectives of anybody who's in a leadership position is figuring out, forget the individual people, but the interaction that will exist between the people, no matter who they are, what are those relationships gonna be like? What are those rituals? What is that belief system? What is your way of doing things that makes your workplace different from every place else, right? You define those things. So as people come and go, the people change, the team changes, but the culture remains the same. I went to mm -hmm. UCLA in the late 80s, early 90s, and there was a fraternity there known as a hardcore party house. Two and a half decades later, my nephew came to UCLA, and unfortunately, he rushed that house, became a, a fraternity member there. All the people were the same, but it was still a hardcore party house. The values, their traditions, their rituals, their belief system remain the same. So in a team, you know, it's the individual people, but a culture is the uh, the rituals and the belief system and the communication system of those people. You want that to be designed deliberately to make sure it's the culture you want, so you don't get stuck with one that you don't. And and how I guess is I guess one of the hardest parts is I mean you mentioned earlier I mean it's it's silly to say oh you know people need to well, I want people to feel like they own the business and act like they own the business, but on the on the other on the other side of that is how do you stop hourly workers like feeling like they're a commodity, feeling like they're just very replaceable and, and that, because I, I feel a lot of times that's how they feel is like, we're a commodity, you know, we, and therefore being part of a culture or purpose or having ownership just seems like alien because of the way they're feeling. Well, first of all, I think in an hourly work environment, so often all discussions of culture are way too abstract. You know, mm -hmm. these ridiculous over the top mission statements, you know, we exist to change the world. Yeah. In the meantime, what this person is on an assembly line or <laughs> they're scooping ice cream, they're not going to feel like they're changing the world. Right. Or we have these, you know, formal values, you know, integrity and camaraderie. Do they even know what these things mean, let alone what they look like? So I mm -hmm. tell people, you know, have a reasonable mission that's that aligns with the work that they're doing. And when you talk about values, turn them into behaviors, do's and don'ts in the workplace where if they do those things, then they are behaving in a way that reflects it. So for integrity, the agreement might be, we always tell the truth. We follow mm -hmm. through on our commitments, right? You give them something that's tangible that is then a reflection of those values so they can understand it so it's not too abstract. Yeah. And so I think that is a, a big part of it. But I think if you don't want them to feel like a commodity, don't treat them like a commodity. Everyone says we're in the people business. So, well, that starts with your employees. And so people want to feel seen as individuals and cared about. And it doesn't just mean you politely ask, hey, how's your mom or how is your game? But it means you get to know what are their goals and what are their ob objectives in life? What do they care about? And then you check in with them about those things. Connect the work they're doing here with the work they wanna be doing someday. Mm -hmm. You know, the 
a lot of in the the increasingly in the hourly work environments, Generation Z is taking up a larger and larger percentage of that workforce. Well, Generation Z is known for being incredibly entrepreneurial. They want to have their own businesses. Mm -hmm. So I tell employers when you hire Gen Z, treat the position like a paid internship, where you're not only training them to work, but you're training them in the ideas and the concepts and the skills that they're going to need for later when they have their own business and have those conversations with them. So they feel like this isn't just making pocket change. They're actually learning things and being prepared for their future. If they feel that that's happening deliberately, they're going to feel more connected to their work. And you know, I, I talked to one owner, he owns um, two beaver tails locations in Canada. It's a big pastry a franchise. And he does that with his employees and they love it. And he has a lot less turnover than others. And a big reason for that is because these people feel like they're learning things they can use later in life. And that's, I, I love that, Scott. I think that's an absolutely fantastic uh, perspective to take. And yeah, I mean, you know, teaching them about business, teaching them about, you know, entrepreneurialism, all of that. I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's a huge value add if it's done correctly. But I, going back to what you were just saying about purpose, it always kind of makes me laugh. You know, the, I call them bumper stickers, you know, when they people have on their website, like, you know, we're customer centric, and then you try calling them and you discover pretty quickly that they're not. And, but the other thing you're saying about apps, it's like when you go on that next door app, and somebody is like, uh, I'm looking for a honest, reliable plumber. And I'm thinking, well, I only know unreliable, dishonest ones, sorry. I mean, that's kind of a given, isn't it? And it's the same thing when you say, you know, if you just put like integrity on the wall, I mean, it doesn't really mean anything. Yeah. So putting that in job listings and putting that on posters and coffee mugs, it's, it, it, it has no meaning whatsoever. And so I think we need to think more in terms of like behaviors. It's like, let's take culture mm -hmm. off the mountaintop yeah. and bring it onto the floor. Right. And let's let's not speak in these large, grandiose terms. Let's get rid of all the pageantry and make these things real. It's like, what what is our belief system? What's our way of doing things? And, you know, I think we think of those terms, then culture can really have a lot more meaning and then be a lot more useful. Yeah. And I guess the other thing, too, is, you know, especially nowadays is is the idea of being more flexible, right, with your with your employees, particularly hourly employees, particularly as maybe they're doing this, as you said, for a different reason. Maybe they're doing this hourly work because they're going to college or they're doing this because they're doing something else or may, or whatever it is. But trying as best you can to work with them to make them feel like, again, they feel valued and you feel you value their contribution. Because obviously with hourly workers is, is scheduling and things like that can can always be a big issue, right? Yeah, well, look, everyone at this point who employs hourly workers, especially younger ones, know that the days of telling people where they're going to be, when they're going to be there, how long they're going to work, dictating that, those mm -hmm. days are over, right? Because they have other options. You know, yeah. they can drive for DoorDash or something and decide when they're going to work, that kind of thing. And younger generations also really prioritize life balance, much, so, much, more, much more so than us older people who have always prided ourselves in how much we've suffered at work. Yeah, exactly. Like they're not into that. They're not going to suffer. They want life balance. That's super important to them. And so part of that is having some flexibility. And so rather than arguing with them, we need to, you know, change things in our end. And there's technologies available. There's things that we can do where people can exchange hours more easily. I met employers that just hire more people so that they can cover each other's shifts. So you figure it out. That is the, you know, when the marketplace, when our customers change their preferences, we don't judge them. We adapt. And we provide the products and services that they want today, not what they wanted yesterday. We don't judge them for that. That's how we have to look at workers, not you know, lament over how things used to be and how this is a broken generation, but what are their values? What do they care about? What do they need? Those of us who can most quickly adapt and meet those needs, we're going to win in the war for workers. And yeah. we're going to have a better work environment that will be more inspiring, that they'll appreciate because it aligns with their value systems. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, yeah, and we come from that generation that just uh, celebrate, celebrates the, celebrated the imbalance. The more, the more lack of balance we had, the more good we felt, the more stressed we are, the harder we're working, all of that. Yeah, all right. of that I worked stuff. 80 hours a week. It's like, why? <laughs> you know, and, what, and what was the cost of that oh, to your relationships, to your health, right? Yeah. It's like, we need to rethink all that stuff. And that's where our own self-awareness comes into play mm -hmm. what is our own value system and is it really applicable in today's environment 
Yeah, hundred percent. Well, listen, Scott, this has been great. All of Scott's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. I'm just going to bring up your book again on screen here so people can see it. Thank you. Well, the main thing that I do is I do uh, keynote speaking, breakout sessions, groups bringing in to talk to their people about what they can do to boost their performance. And I focus on the human side of business, how people think, how they lead and how they serve. The people side of business is my specialty. So if anybody is interested in bringing in to speak to their group, please reach out. My website is scottgreenberg.com, B-E-R-G. Um, and my new book is called Stop the Shift Show, Turn Your Struggling Hourly Workers into a Top Performing Team. And that book is available wherever books are sold. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just been released, as I said, February 13th. And you can see already like the five star ratings. It's already helping a lot of people. So if you've got hourly employees, you need to go read this book, because as you said, Scott, I don't I don't think there's anything comparable out there. I don't need people to read the book. I just need them to buy the book. <laughs> yeah. Love but it. if they read it, that's great, too. <laughs> that's excellent. Well, listen, thanks again. Uh, thanks again, Scott. Uh, thank you for watching and listening. And I will see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me.